welcome back to the program. And we're going to dig now into the lingering 9-11 hangover, which is spilling over into the U.S. presidential race, highlighting the deep and often justified fear of radical and violent Islam, which some say has morphed into mainstream Islamophobia directed at Muslims in general. Take a look. I would not advocate that we put a Muslim in charge of this nation. I absolutely would not agree with that. Controversial, but Carson raised $1 million in the 24 hours after making those comments. And Islam was front and center again at a national conference on religion in Iowa last week. We need to identify the enemy as radical Islam. We cannot pretend that it is not a radical form of Islam. It is. When Democratic candidate Bernie Sanders hosted a town hall recently, a Muslim American student took to the stage to vent. Hearing the rhetoric that's going on in the media makes me sick because I as an individual I'm constantly trying to raise awareness and, and make sure that everyone's treated equally in this country. So president, to the next president of the United States, what do you think about that? The number of Muslims in America has doubled over the last seven years, and Gallup polls in recent years have found that they are amongst the most integrated religious groups in America. But nearly half say they've experienced discrimination. So how to resolve this? Now, for years, millions of Christians in America have had study Bibles to lean on for inspiration and for learning. And now, a radical attempt to make Islam more accessible. The same publishers have come out with the study Quran, aimed at Muslims, Christians, and all religions in the United States and all around the world. Born, of course, from the ashes of 9-11, it's taken 10 years to produce. The co-editor and Islamic studies professor, Jana Dali, joins me from Boston. And Imam Suhaib Webb, a Muslim-American scholar, joins us from Los Angeles. Thank you both for being here to discuss this really important ongoing issue. Can I start by asking you first, why, for instance, Professor Dali, do you think that this will make a difference. What about the study Quran is going to be new and different? Well, I think part of what the book will accomplish is that, um, and if you think about it, you're right, the Quran has in a sense become a public document. Everybody, non-Muslims, Muslims, they quote it at each other on television, on social media, in articles. Um, and there's not really a good resource for people to go to to find out if the interpretation that someone is offering is true, if it's the only interpretation, if it's the best interpretation. And because there's such a low level of religious literacy, not only amongst non-Muslims, but also amongst Muslims about their own religion, it's very easy to capitalize on the general ignorance of people, quote a verse out of context without understanding the ethical reasoning behind it, without understanding the spiritual reasoning behind it, and present it uh, uh, in a biased way, in a way that doesn't take full account of the entire text and of the entire Islamic tradition. And what the book, uh, we hope, will do is allow people to um, visualize and conceptualize that just because someone quotes the Qur'an and offers an opinion about it doesn't mean that that's the correct opinion or that most Muslims have interpreted that way through history. Isn't that just the point? And I was going to ask uh, Imam Webb. That is the point, right? Because uh, the Quran, as we've seen since 9-11, as people have been so, you know, directed to the Islamic faith, has been used to justify or to uh, apologize for whatever and wherever anything happens. So in other words, it's really confusing. People don't know what the actual verses say, what the sub-verses say, the surahs and other such things. You know, do you think this is going to penetrate what is already a very thick layer of, of misinformation around the Quran? Indeed, I think if there's a willingness to penetrate that, this text is remarkable in that it does allow for really a dual process of education. Within the Muslim community, we've seen strains of hyper-literalism, and this really is going to make Muslims aware of the fact that even their holy book has a large number of scholars who looked at it from many different angles, interpreted it. On the other end, you have the Islamophobia industry, who also is purporting to say, you know, Muslims are hyper-literal, where now a text is coming out that shows the holy text itself has a large number of opinions, 
um, variant ideas around just one single word or one single sentence. So if people are willing to look beyond some of the emotional rhetoric, rhetoric they're going to see a very powerful interpretive uh, tool in this beautiful translation.